It's an amazing song. It just kind of happened. It took about 10 minutes, I guess. Bart, you didn't write this song in 10 minutes. It took a lifetime. How'd you do this? You know, I've never told anybody my story. When I was uh, 11 years old, life was tough. Where's Mama? She's gone. She don't want me no more. No! And she don't want you neither. And I've always loved music. And I found some songs that I just, I held on to. They gave me hope. Mercy me, that can't be his real voice. Because I needed it. Dad, I can do this. No, you can't. And you're going to blink your eyes, and you're going to realize that life has gotten you nowhere because you chased some stupid dream. I can I'm leaving. Shit. I want you to know that I pray for you all the time. When I want. And I hope that you find whatever it is that you're looking for out there. What are you running from? My dad. Then write about it. Let that pain become your inspiration. I got some stuff I need to sort out. And I deal with it the only way I know how. And that's to write a song. You hungry? I set the table. What is this? I want to make things right. You and me. Dad was a monster, and I saw God transform him. You have a gift, real gift. I didn't think that God could do that. And so I wrote this song for my dad. Yeah. Song that we all grew up with. Uh, we grew up in church culture, and yeah. a movie that's coming out March the 16th, 316. March 316. Wow. That's an easy day to remember. That's right? amazing. Can we welcome Bart Miller from Mercy Me, everybody, and Madeline Carroll? <laughs> Madeline, it's good to have you with us. And then John Irwin from the Irwin Brothers, who's really the producer behind the movie. Uh, John, uh, take us behind uh, the scenes of how this whole thing got started in the first place. And, uh, yeah. and also tell, tell the story uh, from a 10,000 foot level of what this movie's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for having us, guys. I love this campus, the spirit that's here, even backstage. Um, it's just an amazing, don't take this for granted. This is an amazing environment and an amazing place. Don't, don't take your time here for granted. Um, I'm John, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, thanks for uh, having us, and, uh, and this is the film. I'm, I'm curious, how many of you guys know the song, I Can Only Imagine? That's great. I think my kids might go to college. This is great. Uh, maybe here. Um, uh, my brother and I make films. Uh, we made a film, Woodlawn, that we talked about here, which was fun. Thanks, guys. And, um, you know, we, we're just, we're storytellers, serving the greatest storyteller of all time. And uh, I remember T.D. Jake saying, uh, Jesus was a storyteller, so if he's around today, he'd be a filmmaker. I'm like, I don't know if that's true, but I'll, I'll take it. And, uh, and before I talk about the film, I just want to say that I, I'm a firm believer in this idea that we all have like a unique ability, like something special that we're built for. And when you discover that thing, and then you use it not for yourself, but for God's glory, uh, you'll never be happier in life in terms of your work. Um, and and I, I just, I hope and pray for each of you that, uh, like, like me, that you find what you're born to do, what you're destined to do, and then that you, you have the courage to not do it for yourself and do it for God's glory instead of your own, because life becomes this amazing adventure. And, uh, and each, of, each of us has one of those things. Uh, and I discovered, you know, my thing w was a camera. And uh, that's what God wanted my brother and I to do. And so we look for great stories. This song was an anchor in my life at a painful time in my life, time of loss. Uh, I probably listened to this song a hundred times in a row and closed my eyes and thought of a, of a time without pain and, and without suffering. But I had no idea that there was this incredible story uh, behind the song. My brother and I worked in the music business for many years, and my brother got to know Bart, and uh, we heard the story of this song, and, and he had me hooked when he said, uh, I, uh, he said, I know God is real because of the transformation I saw with my dad. He said, I watched a monster change into my best friend and the man I wanted to become. And it was the mending of that relationship 
uh, that inspired the song we all know and love. So it's like we know Imagine is a song about heaven. What we don't know is that Bart's singing it for his dad. And just that idea that God can change anybody and that God can change any situation. When Dennis Quaid signed on to play the part, he said, I've never played transformation on film like this before. You know, and it was just this incredible story that led to this incredible song. And Andy and I thought, okay, we, we have to bring this to the screen. Yeah, so Bart, tell us the story. I mean, uh, the song, but honestly, just your relationship with your dad, I know it'll be unpacked in the movie, but uh, take us there. Yeah, my, uh, uh, my parents divorced when I was three, and um, I lived with my dad. My mom remarried um, a couple of times, but in third grade, she remarried and, and moved from outside of Dallas to San Antonio. And they thought it was best for my brother and I to stay with my dad in this small town in Greenville, Texas, in a and uh, yeah, right. And um, somebody cheered for Greenville. Um, but uh, and just that we'd stay kind of with the rest of the family, stuff like that. The thing that we didn't realize, my dad became very abusive towards me. Uh, not so much my brother, but uh, I don't remember many weeks where I wasn't beaten three or four times a week for most of my life until about, man, I guess uh, my freshman year in, in high school, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I got the front row seat to see the gospel transformed this man from a monster to the godliest man I've ever known. And uh, by the time he passed away, this was the guy I wanted to be like when I grew up. And so leaving the gravesite, my grandmother said, I can only imagine what Bub's seeing in heaven. And as a 19-year-old, I became completely obsessed with heaven. Not because I was some spiritual giant. It's, it was more, almost like OCD. It was like, a, it was like a tick for me to imagine him being whole than looking at an empty bedroom. And so uh, I, I became obsessed with, the, I would write, I can only imagine, down on everything I can get my hands on. If I was on hold on a phone, remember when phones were on a wall and had a cord, remember that a long time ago? Well, and if I was on hold, I'd be doodling imagine on anything I get my hands on for years. And so started Mercy Me, we were uh, doing an independent record, and we needed one more song for the album, and I was looking for a blank page to, to write on, and every page and every journal I had, I had I can only imagine written on it. And so I was like, all right, God, I get it. And uh Wrote it in about 10 minutes, but it had been in my heart for a few years, and I uh, knew it was special, but I had no idea I'd ever be sitting here 20 years later talking about it. Man, I remember back in 99, uh, we were actually putt-putting on the side of a mountain in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Yes, Hillbilly Golf, I Hillbilly remember Hillbilly well. Golf. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> ever been to Hillbilly Golf. You, you, get in a, you get in like a— uh, It's the same person that cheered for Greenville, I think. So. That's right. <laughs> You don't have to, what people don't know is you don't have to have a mullet to do hillbilly golf. You can just know someone who's That's true, yes. And uh, we, we got in an elevator, and we were going up to go putt-putting together, and, and, um, and you said, hey, tonight, we were, we were together at this event, and you, you were just leading worship, and you said, tonight, I want to do a song that's not necessarily a worship song as in vertical, but a new one. And uh, I heard it for the first time and knew instantly that this song was going to uh, honestly shift the course of your life. Because I knew God was on the song, and um, I remember at the end of the night, you and I were talking about how this is going to be a song that people are going to play, not just at funerals, but like John just said, uh, in a moment where they need, to, they need to be reminded of heaven when they're going through hell on earth, and they need to be reminded that this is a temporary affliction, and they have an eternal hope in Christ. And you've become a bit that guy. You've become a guy who um, hears the stories of people's passing and hears the stories of people's afflictions. Uh, because this song has just risen to become the number one selling Christian song of all times on iTunes. And so, what's it like to become that guy that um, hears at every concert someone's uh, funeral story and how this song ministered to them? Oh, man, it's heavy. I mean, every story is is more tragic than the last is what it feels like. And so, but, you know, it's, you know, it's, you have your on days and your off days, but you do, you do your best to try to respectfully hear what they have to say, because um, from my standpoint, I'll hear a hundred stories a day, it feels like, and but from them, it's their only chance. For whatever reason, they feel like God is, in, the Spirit's led them to tell me, and I don't get it, but somehow it's bringing comfort to them just to voice what they're going through, and so I'm, man, I'm, yeah, I, it's the least I could do is to, to, to hear their heart and hear what they're going through, and it doesn't feel like much on my end, but it seems like it, it means something to them. And Madeline, you, um, you know, you're just a, a rising star in Hollywood and um, signed on to be a part of this project. But I think this was more than just a role for you. This was personal because you're a believer in Christ and brought up in a strong Christian home. And I um, would love to talk and hear a little bit of your story 
uh, that kind of prepared you for this role, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, I would love to share. Um, so one of the things I'm grateful for with Imagine is I've gotten the chance to share my testimony, which, to be honest, but it's how God works, I never ever thought that it would touch or you know, reach anyone. I just thought it was, you know, what God did for me, and that's amazing, and that's great in my life, but I didn't think that it would um, really speak to anyone else. So I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity to do this because um, just like dreams coming true this year. So uh, basically I'll start, I started off at three and a half years old acting. God literally put me on the path. It was nothing that, you know, I pursued at three or that my mom pursued for me. And I just so happened to be at a nail salon in um, Sherman Oaks in LA, it's where I'm from. And <laughs> thanks. Uh, LA and um, so I was there and, and the the salon chair I was in just so happened to literally be back to back to a talent agent and um, I'm talking and you know going on and this this woman hears me and she thinks I'm seven years old she comes around the corner and I'm three she's like can't believe it but despite all odds she still wanted to see me even though they only accept kids like six seven and up um, so I go there she ends up signing me um, and it just like started this whole thing. It's literally all that I've known. It's all that I've ever done. And I just loved it. I loved it so much and um, always had a deep relationship with God growing up. Um, I created my own, you know, discovered my own personal relationship with God when I was uh, nine years old. I always went to church, um, but really started reading my Bible and everything at that age. So spiritual things were happening in my life along with like doing TV and commercials and then um, just working so much. God just kept opening doors for me. And so I really wasn't used to anything else. I didn't know that it was such a struggle because God's favor was just immense um, at that time in my life. And so I hit um, 11. I did my first lead role in a movie called Swing Vote with Kevin Costner, which was like a whole miracle um, in itself uh, that I even got the role. My mom prayed seven times around the casting office like the walls of Jericho, for real. Um, and so thankful for my mama. Um, and I uh, just it kept working. And um, right at the time that that movie came out, a lot of stuff was happening for me. They actually like were going to campaign for me to like get an Oscar and all this stuff, which was really cool. But um, th th it just like opened a lot of doors. So I get a call from this director. Uh, my mom actually got a call from this director to be in his next superhero movie. So it's kind of like the Marvel of that time. Like this was before Marvel. This is like the big deal. Um, and I get this. They just want to offer me this part. Didn't even want to read me. Didn't want to see me. Like they just wanted to give it to me, which is insane. Like that's completely crazy. So I thought it was God. I was like, this must be the Lord. Like, this has to be God. So, um, so I, uh, talked to the director, love it. Can't believe I'm going to learn like martial arts, learn how to do butterfly knives, all this stuff. It's going to be amazing. And it was literally like God laid before me fame, fortune, and like an easy setup the rest of my life. I was getting, uh, two, two movies to myself after that one. Um, and just getting ridiculous money. And I just knew there's certain scripts that come across your way that you're like, well, this is going to be an overnight life changer. And then there's ones that you do that just cause you want to do them, but there's ones that really stand out and you know, like my life's going to be changed. So, um, I read it, it was really, really dirty, um, really dirty script, and um, the character that I would play was really dirty. But I was like, God, like, this has to be you, like, this fell on my lap, like, this is how the devil tempts you. And I was like, this, like, this has to be God. And so um, me and my mom, like, prayed about it, and we asked them, like, would it be possible for you to change the language? Like, can I, can you just remove my parts of the movie that are wrong? And they were like, yeah, sure, we just want you. So it's like favor of God. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, these huge studio people, like, are willing to do whatever we're asking. And so um, I ended up signing on. I literally go meet everybody um, at the studio, um, signing, going to do papers and contracts and everything. And literally, I'm not joking, that night, I go to a um, healing service at my church, a worship service, and out of the full congregation, the pastor calls me up to come pray for a little boy to receive hearing. So I go up and I pray and I, and I lay hands on him and I come back to my seat and I look at my mom and I said, Mom, I can't do this movie. And she's like, oh, thank God, why? And uh, she, she didn't have a good feeling about it. And, and I said, because it's not going to line up with who I'm called to be in God. It's not going to line up with what he wants of me. 
Thank you. Um, and so, so I did that, made that choice, and of course, you know, everyone uh, on my team's like, "You're crazy! Like, what's wrong with you? Like, we're, you're set up for life." And they were right because the girl who did it and the girl who ended up doing the part went on to get everything, went on to be famous overnight, went on to do, you know, mega movies, huge movies. So I was like. Lord, like, what? okay, so I, I give that up for you, like, what's happening? Um, and then literally, like, two years later, I got a movie called Flipped, directed by Rob Reiner. Oh my gosh, you guys saw it? That's awesome. So proud of that movie. So anyway, um, that's awesome. So anyway, I, uh, God, God was truly a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He rewarded me for that, and he continued to reward me for that. And then I hit 15, and um, everything changed. I was no longer, you know, getting these clean-cut, edifying roles. I began to get, you know, sent these parts where I would have to do things that I didn't want to do. So that became a struggle. That became, I'm at like the peak of my career, everything's happening for me, doing a bunch of films, and then it just all stopped. And then all these roles were just so incredibly dirty. So I began like this journey of a really, really hard struggle with God. Really, really hard decisions. Being tempted left and right. Being offered all kinds of parts and shows that I didn't want to do. I ended up on a show, but um, a few episodes into this show, um, they wanted me to do something that I wasn't comfortable with. And I was literally on my way to church, and I, and I, and I read this script, and I, and I like had my mom pull over, I throw open the door, and I start throwing up outside the car. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe what I'm reading, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I, I was like, God, like what is, I'm panicking because in TV you're under contract, so you can't get out of it. Like you literally can't get out of it, you're forced to do it. So I'm like roaring and crying, and I, and I said, you know what, I'm just, I'm, I gotta pray. I said, God, you have allowed me to dodge landmines my full career. There's no way that you would get me to this place, that I am legally bound and there's nothing I can do. Like that's just not who you are. So I said, God, somehow, some way, you're gonna, I'm not gonna be upset about this anymore. I said, you're gonna turn this around. And matter of fact, you're going to somehow glorify yourself in it and get me out of this. So I gave him like this whole instruction. I'm not kidding you. It was one of the hardest things I ever had to do because one of my friends is who got me the part on the show, one of the producers. So I'm mortified because now his, you know, neck's in the noose for getting me on the show and causing all this. So despite all that fear and, and anxiety, you know, things like that, they can kind of corner you and make you think, you know, I have to do something like there's a gun to your head. But I knew who God was and I knew that God was bigger than what was going on in the natural. And so I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do it. It's just, I, I, I'm, I, there's nothing else I can say other than I can't do this. Please don't make me do this. And I'm not joking with you. Instead of being upset, instead of being angry, I got called 20 times this one day by this number that I didn't know, and I don't answer numbers, I don't know. And they called me, called me, called me. Finally, they start calling my house phone. So I answer, and I'm like, hello? It is the lead actress on the show, whose show it is, who's, you know, crazy big, and um, I'm, I'm like, can't believe it. I'm like, oh, hi, and, and I think that they're gonna yell at me. And they literally said to me, I just want you to know that it has spoke so much to so many of us over here. And we can't believe, especially me, I can't believe this choice that you've made because there are things that I wish that I could take back in my career that I'm not able to take back now. And I didn't have the boldness that you had. And I didn't see God that way. But I just want you to know that don't feel ashamed and don't feel like you made a wrong decision because God is your casting director. God is your director and God is your producer. And so, God just really showed up and showed out and, and, and glorified himself in that. And so it just, it was, that was a one piece of this really hard journey that I went through with God. And finally, this time last year, I was completely broken. I was so depressed. I was like just seeing all this opposition all the time and these dirty parts and these things that, you know, I don't even want to do. And um, I was devastated. And, and I said, God, I, I don't understand, do you not want this of me anymore? Is this no longer the dream that you have for me anymore? And I said, God, I love this. This is what I love to do. But God, if you're no longer calling me here, I love you more than I love this. And I laid it before God and I let it die. I said, here it is. I don't care for it. I just wanna serve you. And God, I just, I miss your presence, Lord. And if this isn't what you have of me, I don't wanna go one more day feeling this confusion. I don't wanna go one more day having this fear and anxiety. And I said, God, if I'm still meant to be here, 
here, send me something, Lord. And I said, better yet, send me something that would edify you. And I'm not kidding, the next day I get a call from a director who remembered me a year prior coming in and auditioning for him in the midst of my depression, and he saw something in me, which was the Lord, and remembered me a year later. So literally God answered my prayer the next day. And then from there, I like give my testimony to him and to this director and he got like re-saved and just couldn't believe everything that God did. And two months later, I'm at a separate audition for something else. This woman who just so happened to get paired up with me to be my mom, knew who I was, knew that I was a believer and said, you need to go out on that new movie I can only imagine. And I said, like the song? And she was like, yes, like the song. I knew, we all know the song. We love the song. I was like, this is gonna be powerful. I called my manager and um, and I, uh, I said, you gotta get me in for this show, uh, for this movie. And it just so happened the way that the timing worked out, I was actually gone, coming back to LA. And so they had been reading people, they had seen people, but the timing of it just worked out to where I, I came in for just a meet and greet with them. So that's kind of a rare thing in itself. Normally you just go in and you audition. But God allowed me to go in and talk with John and Andy and Kevin for an hour about God. They saw my heart for him before they saw me as an actress. And that is what set me apart. That. And so whatever you are called to do, whatever it is, the thing that sets you apart, everyone in this room, is God has put himself inside of you and is calling it out. God is calling it out, and that's what he did for me, and that's why I'm here, and, and there's things that I prayed for at 10 years old coming to fruition into my life today. Like, this is the God that we serve. And, and I just want to say, when you stand true to your conviction and your morals, that is your compass to your soul. And so you have to, you have to even, even when it's hard, Isaiah 54, 17 is one of my favorite verses, and it says, the heritage of the servants of the Lord is triumph over opposition. And I stand on that verse all the time because I am called to a place that literally is Sodom and Gomorrah. I am surrounded by opposition 24-7. I am more familiar with being rejected than I am accepted. I am more familiar with being judged than loved. And so just, I, I just want, want you to know that God is able and God is the all-triumphant God, and He is the God El Roy. He sees you. He sees you exactly where you are. And it is a miracle. My life is a living testimony miracle of who He is and what He is able to do. Yeah. Come on. Long that's answer. Mark and I will just be, because that's incredible. Gosh, <laughs> so I must my not so long. Hello, that, is, that is such great truth. Bart just said. Every head bowed and every eye closed. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, praise the Lord. I, I, John, speak into that a little further. I mean, um, just the tension right now of faith and fame, not just in Hollywood, but just you as a filmmaker, even knowing that so many times people are asking you to um, blurry up the boundaries of what God's put on your yeah. heart as a believer to order, in order to get more traffic to a movie. Hey, it, yeah. needs, it needs artistic expression, which usually means more vulgarity or more, how do you deal with that? And what advice can you give someone who's dealing with that? In you know, life? I think uh, there's a scene in the film where uh, all these music executives tell Bart all the reasons why he's not going to make it and why he's going to fail. And it was so easy because I just had to write all the things that movie executives had said to me and Andy over, over the years. And, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to face rejection, but if you're called to something, I tell people, like, if you want to be in the film business, like, like people ask me, what's it like to be in the movie business? I'm like, it's like the Hunger Games. There's just people dying all the time and alliances and betrayals. <laughs> Don't trust anyone. But uh, if there's anything else you can do and be happy, do it. But if God's calling you to it, I think the biggest thing is don't compromise and don't give up. Amen. Success is long obedience in the same direction. It's going to take a lot longer than you think. But don't give up if God's uh, calling you to it. And, and I think in a greater sense, as Christians, it's why I wanted to bring Madeline here. Um, let's start playing cultural offense again. Let's get bold. And, and to me, my Bible says on this rock, uh, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, a gate's not, nobody's going to throw a gate at you or attack you with a gate. Gates are meant to be stormed, right? And so let's take the gospel to the movie theaters and to culture and, and, and let's do our very best. Um, and let's earn the message that we care so deeply about, not, not use it as a crutch. Um, uh, let's get better and better at what we do, and let's strive for excellence. And uh, if God's calling you to something here, go for it. Go for it. Amen. Uh, 
but it's going to take a while, and just don't give up. Uh, and, and who knows, you know, some people give up right around when success is right around the corner. And uh, so stay in it and, and don't give up. And, and don't listen to what people say about you. Listen to what God says about you. And, and, and keep that in the forefront of your mind. So good. Hey, Bart, can you talk to us just for a few minutes about um, beyond just I can only imagine. That's not just the biggest song in Mercy Me's catalog. It's the biggest song in all of Christian music's history to this date as far as sales and success. But you know, beyond that, God's transcended your band to uh, 22 number one hits in Christian music and uh, the legacy of your ministry through Mercy Me. Uh, take us back into that and tell us the story of Mercy Me. How did the name even come about, you know? And then uh, what's it been like to, to lead worship uh, just for a generation? Well, we started back in 1994, so it's been almost 24 years, back in the 1900s. And um, um, we were independent up until, oh, y all, how many, was anybody born, y'all were, y'all were born anybody like in 2007, in right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we were independent up until uh, 1999, 2000. And, um, we made six independent records on our own and did church camps to pay the bills for a lot of years. That's where we met for the first time years ago. And, and, um, and then because of Imagine, we ended up signing a record deal. And um, um, yeah, it's been crazy. It's, 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 um, it's you know, I, I think, I, 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 I probably shouldn't say this here, but I'll say anyway, like I took that fatal semester off my sophomore year in college. So I'm 45 and still a sophomore, so it keeps me young. But uh, that's uh, that's when I started the band and thought I would take a semester off and just kind of regroup and and um, and and never went back. And um, not recommending that. At yeah, all. yeah, yeah. It was a horrible choice, by the way. <laughs> and um, they they didn't have online back then. That's now, true. Now there's online. That is very true. You yes, it. you yes. can finish your degree at Liberty University online. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yes. It was long before the interwebs. And. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so we, we, um, we just went wherever people would have us and, and make music. And I, I never, I, you know, I, we never thought it would be this big. We just, we wanted to just get to the next show and we wanted to make enough money to make the next record and, um, and hopefully marry one day and have a family. And um, yeah, I think I was making almost just over $10,000 a year when I asked my my in-laws if I could marry their daughter, and they thought I was nuts, but um, it worked out. We're all right. We're good. So Madeline actually <laughs> plays uh, the girlfriend role in the movie, right? And then who eventually becomes yep. your wife. Yep. What does your wife think of Madeline playing her in the movie? Oh, uh, she thinks they got it right. I got the heavy set dude, and Shannon got the good looking girl, so it uh, <laughs> worked out great. I got a hobbit, and she got a model, so it worked out great. <laughs> so. <laughs> hey, that was the actor's joke, not mine, so it's okay. He's a no, uh, she loves her, and yeah, she thought it was awesome. And when they met, it was pretty crazy. They met at the premiere last Monday, and both of them with tears in their eyes were like, it was just a really sweet moment. Like, I'm telling you, man, I don't, I've never done the movie stuff, so I don't know how it works, but I know that it's, there seems to be something going on, even being with the cast. And like, we've been with Dennis Quaid the last week or so, and just uh, he keeps, he's like, man, you're, you're, the role of your dad has done something to me. I don't know what it is. It's just, I don't know, maybe every movie's like that. I have no idea, but I know this one has been, um, it's been a really kind of just weird thing happening uh, with everybody that's involved with it. We were, we were at NRB uh, three days ago, and Dennis was on stage getting interviewed by Eric, Eric Metaxas, and he said, you know, it just makes me, this film makes me remember when I went forward in a Baptist church when he was young, and he said, you know, when you, when you go forward to, to make that decision, it, you're afraid that you're losing something, when in reality, you're gaining everything. And we're like, wait, did Dennis, did Dennis just say that? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, the movie's changing people. It changed me, for sure. Dennis Quaid, of course, is who you're referring to. And then Trace Atkins, the country star, is in this movie as well, playing the role of uh, Brickle, who, by the way, is here. Uh, Scott Brickle, who was, who's the manager of Mercy Me and uh, got him the record deal and really pushed and championed the song more than anything else. Uh, can we get the camera on Scott Brickle? He looks like a biblical character Where right you, there. Brickle? All right, there he is. Yeah. Right there. Good to have, he goes by Hag. He goes this over there. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> he goes by Hagrid. <laughs> He used, to, he used to go by Scott, and yeah. then all of a sudden this movie comes out, Trace Atkins is playing him. Uh, I, called, I called him the other day, and his voicemail was like, hey, 
This is Brickle. He's going with Brickle now. He's oh, going I've with... never known him anything other than Brickle, so yeah. you call him Scott, it means he's in trouble. <laughs> and then, of course, about, can we get the camera back on? Madeline, your, your mom is here in the audience There's as well. There's my mom. She's just been great. <laughs> no, not Brickle, the one next to you, right yeah. there. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Come on, Miss Carol. Can we wait five? Can we say thank you for just raising your daughter in, in just the legacy of the things of God? Grateful for that. Woo! Um, we thought. Um, we thought today is a perfect day to make an announcement to you. Um, in, uh, in the middle of our campus, obviously, uh, are the buildings that are so much older than even our university uh, is the uh, Glass Mansion. We, you know, we, um, we, we know the Montview Mansion there, and then there's the chapel, and right to the right of it is this prayer garden. And um, recently, the Falwell family felt like it would be uh, a really honorable thing if we took that prayer garden and we turned it into a, a bit of a memorial garden in, in honor of so many of our students that um, go to be with the Lord. And um, on any given year, uh, as, as much as we'd love to have a year where we go, this did not happen this year, just about every year, um, we have students who come into this family, become Liberty students, whether online or on campus, and um, end up passing away and end up going to be with the Lord. If you've ever been to our commencement services, for example, you know that there in the front row typically are a few empty chairs with their gowns uh, decorated, uh, but the person missing because uh, we're remembering people who passed away. And um, uh, we wanted to create an environment where those families could come and see a plaque you know, uh, and know that we are always thinking of them, could have a place uh, that could memorialize uh, the memory, obviously, of those folks. And so, um, several folks have been working on this project. Uh, I do want to kind of bring that before you and tell you by commencement this year, our plan is to launch that new garden um, in memory, and it's going to be a special place for us. We'll use it also as a place of worship in a more intimate setting. Um, my wife's been pretty deep into the planning program with this thing, and she comes home a lot and talks about the little bitty details that are going to go into this that are going to really be special for family members who will come again and again and see this place. And so that's going to be in construction mode. And um, what's interesting is um, uh, we went back and thought of a senior in this room right now who maybe came in on their freshman year who maybe knows a student who passed away uh, and, uh, and thought about the last three to four years of students who on this campus, um, on this campus, not online, because we have over 300 students, honestly, who, if you include our online family as well, but on this campus who uh, passed away and thought it would be great on this day to, with this song, um, just stop and think about them and not only make that announcement to you, but uh, hear the song from that lens. And so we're going to watch this and then ask Bart one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll get out of here. Let's watch this together. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I would do Is forever Forever work 
worship you I can only imagine yeah I can only imagine surrounded by your glory one will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still To my knees, will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. The tragedy in so much of that is that um, we've all been in that moment where um, we've held the hand of a parent who, who thinks to herself or to himself, uh, my children should come to my funeral and not the other way around. But we have a hope in that uh, even though death has eternally lost its thing, we know that, that mourning in the moment is very real. And um, we wanted that garden to be a place where those families could come and always, always know that they're always in our heart and always in our mind. And those 11 really represent um, a group of people that we know and a group of people that will always be, always be a part of our family. Uh, Bart, I, I wanted to end this time with you and just get some advice because, again, almost on a daily basis, you are tasked with giving advice when someone is going through something like that. Uh, my favorite moment with you in all the years we've known each other as a friend is when uh, one time um, I have a friend, his name is Jeff Bannon, and he's with the Lord now, and he had Luke Garrick's disease, and Jeff's body had deteriorated down to where he could no longer even breathe on his own. Everything in his body had shut down, and um, he could only talk with a click of a chin through a machine. And one night, Jeff's wife called and said, hey, um, Jeff is spending his final evening before we take him off the machine to be with the Lord with his two boys and then and me. And uh, he's been on repeat with that song, I Can Only Imagine. And I, he, she said, uh, is there any way that maybe Bart Millard could call in? Jeff can't talk. He can click. But we'll, we'll say what he's clicking, you know, to the screen. And I called you, and you were in the line getting popcorn in a movie theater. And I said, hey, buddy, can you, can you just call this family? And um, you got out, and I, I, I remember sitting there and just listening to you sing that song, like in a parking lot of a movie theater, sing I Can Only Imagine to this family. And he was just clicking again, the word again, over and over again. And you just spoke life into the life of uh, these two little boys who didn't understand that this was their last evening with their dad. And then a wife who knew in about an hour her husband's machine was going to be turned off. And it wasn't ultimately goodbye because she'd see him in eternity. But um, you spoke into that. W w give us advice. We're all going to go to funerals. We're always going to, we, we, you know, we're... What do you say to people like that, like you did that night? And what are some things that we can take away where we can be a shoulder to cry on, you know, in a moment like that? I don't know if there's anything you really can say. I mean, you know, the hard part about getting older is you, you lose people. And I was 19 when my father passed away. And, and um, 
The only two things I remember in my life that mattered was my brother saying, I'm here if you need to cuss me out, beat me up, punch me, whatever. Shake your fist at God. I'll do it with you. And the other thing that really stuck with me years later is um, uh, when Greg Laurie's son passed away, I, I think Stephen Chris Chapman called him after losing his daughter and said, hey, I just need to remind you that your son is a far greater part of your future than he is of your past. And I'd never heard it that way in my life. And, um, and I'm, I was like, you know, I'm a grown man hearing it. And it was as if my dad died four hours before. I just started sobbing because I'd never heard that. Because before that moment, I would say there was nothing you can say to bring comfort. Because we've heard it all. You know, it's, that's why we bring like potluck dinner because we can't figure out what to say. We bring casseroles instead. It's what Baptists do. And, uh, and, uh, and we do it a lot. And that was the first time that I heard something like that where I was like, oh, it brought comfort to me 30 years later just to know that, oh my gosh, this is not the end. And even though I knew it, I just never heard it that, put that way. And man, the thing is, you're never going to say the right thing. All you, all you can do is be there with them. Be there with them when they're at their ugliest, when it hurts the most, and just love them. Like the craziest thing as a parent, and this is, seem, it's connected, but I've got five kids. I'm married to Shannon for 20 years, and, and um, my kids at home can be jerks. Like, they act up like crazy. I'm like, what is their problem? Like, they're fine in public. What's their deal here? And somebody once told us, said, when your kids act up in front of you, it's because they're, they feel safe enough to act up and know that you will still love them regardless. And I was like, oh my gosh, that means we're the greatest parents ever because they're jerk kids. <laughs> and, uh, but man, there is something about that between the, the, the closest friendships that you'll ever have is that you're able to just fall apart to those people closest to you because you know they'll love you regardless. And so, man, you just got to figure out if you have people in your world or if you're that person, stick close to those people that will love you regardless. And just, man, be mad at God. He's got broad shoulders. He can handle it. And uh, we're not going to have the right things to say. Just being there for him is the thing that's going to, you're going to remember the most. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say when I first sat down with Bart and said, Describe the phenomenon of this song. I mean, how do you guys all know it? it was know it? It was written before you were born. You know, what is the phenomenon of I Can Only Imagine? And how would an independent band from Texas write the best-selling, most-played Christian song of all time? It's been streamed nearly 100 million times. And, um, and he said, it's a rush of hope. That's what you feel when you hear the song. So when we set out to make the movie, the whole concept of the movie was we want to create this symphony of hope that God can redeem any person, God can change any situation, God can transform any life or any relationship. And sometimes it's even to the artists in the room, it's even your pain that can become your greatest inspiration and, and that can give you a voice uh, to the world. So I want everybody in this room to know, and that's what I hope you feel when you see the movie. Um, there's always hope. There's always hope, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what relationship you're in that is torn. Uh, this is a story um, that, is, that is a rush of hope, and I hope that hope finds you in your own life. Yeah, I think, um, like Bart was saying, you'd be, the answer is yes when someone's in that moment, whatever they're asking, whether you're just stepping out of a movie theater for just a minute to sing, or whether you're just showing up with a chicken casserole for somebody who just doesn't have to worry about the next meal at least, or whatever. The answer is yes to whatever the request is. And then you don't have to, Jesus, you can have Bible verses and Christianese and all that. Just sometimes there's power in just sitting beside somebody and letting them be angry and go through the emotion of the moment. And they don't need a sermon from you. They just need a friend. And there's power in that. And, and then there are also tools like a song that sometimes can usher in hope that um, um, maybe you, you don't have to because of the power of something like this. I'm so grateful for this. I'm, I'm grateful that it's done in excellence, John, and you and your brother have done a phenomenal job. We are going to get behind this movie because we believe God is in it, and we, we are grateful for it. Uh, we've been asked to do something together. We've been asked to uh, uh, kind of wave a flag for this movie uh, by the production team, and um, as Christians, we believe there's value in this, and so we want to we wanna leverage our voice towards it, and so I think you're just going to do hashtag, what, do we have that ready, guys? Uh, I can only imagine, and we want to we get it on the map on social media, and so if you would consider getting out your phone and getting on Instagram and Twitter and this, just making 
making your voice known that you plan to go and uh, or tell your friends that you want to be a part of this because I think again the gospel shared in this movie and it's a real evangelistic tool and it is coming out March the 16th. Can we just thank these brothers and our sister for being here? So thankful for you. Yeah.